Okay, so now I will uh, introduce uh, today's speaker, Stacy uh, Levy. Um, Stacy is a graduate of Yale University. Um, she uh, received her uh, Master's of Fine Arts at the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. Um, she also attended the Architectural Association in London. Um, Stacy works to bridge uh, between art and science, um, working with rain, urban tides, and aquatic food webs. Particularly, some of her work highlights unseen life forms inhabiting local waters. Um, one of Stacy's most uh, recent or current projects, rather, um, is working in the East Midtown Greenway in New York City to magnify the common forms of diatoms living in the East River. Um, I also want to just share with you uh, Stacy's website um, where she uh, references I, I don't know. I, I started counting and I and I lost count of how many works and installations you've you've participated in. But it's an impressive number, at least over 50, if not 100. Um, but it was, it was really cool to uh, see your website. <laughs> Love to direct people there when Stacy is done talking. <laughs> and so um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Stacy. And look forward to your talk. Great. Thanks so much. This is really exciting to be part of this. Uh, giving a talk. Um, talking to scientists is one of my um, favorite things to do because I think there's so much work, and you will see, um, between where science and art can do collaborations that have a lot of meaning for people. So I'm going to jump right in, but thank you so much for having me, and thanks everyone for coming to this talk. Uh, let's see, now we need to just make sure we're in here. Um, so I, I do feel that art can be a really wonderful tool for um, un, for us to understand nature, to make nature legible, translatable, and readable. And it's pretty much my mission, as I refer to myself as an eco artist, slightly different than an environmental artist, because I'm interested in in systems, not just showing nature, but also in how the systems work. So it's it's my job to make these less visible aspects of rather simple ecology more visible. It's something we just don't know about, like food webs. And um, so I'm often creating uh, art that shows how nature works. And one of the important things about what I'm creating is that it's in places where people can just walk into it, uh, find themselves there and spend time with it. It's sort of like a living textbook that's out in a park, out in an arboretum, out at a train station or in a parking lot. Um, so that you can absorb this information. Sometimes my projects are rather large. And in this case, this is the one that's down in Arkansas that David and I were talking about, showing the process of water filtration. And um, this particular project is doing kind of the work of an engineered landscape. It's a floating wetland and it's filtering the water and showing the process as it goes. So it's very much telling the story about how wetlands are essential for absorbing these chemicals that are flowing off lawns and farm fields and polluting the lakes with nitrogen and phosphorus. Sometimes the works are far more contained. Perhaps some of you have flown into Philadelphia with some baggage to Terminal F and you will see this map of the historic streams and the present day streams. Um, but mostly I'm noticing, I've noticed throughout my life that people don't understand their own backyard ecology, uh, have no idea how nature is at work around them. A lot of people just think we're in the city, there's no nature here, but nature's everywhere and we should get to know it. So I do throw down this challenge. How are scientists and artists going to bring people um, a new way of understanding their natural world so that they can really see what's happening? And I do believe too that art and science needs to hold hands. We really need to go on several dates to make um, nature more present and more understood in our everyday lives. Uh, art was once the primary method of showing and exploring the natural world. That's who was doing it. We're mostly artists who were investigating the world and art and science were twinned as ways of exploring how nature works. Leonardo da Vinci is are probably the most famous proponent of this was the person who not only was a painter of amazing things, but figured out hydrology. Um, over time though, we gained this new form of observing and describing nature through lots of mechanized ways and also through photography. And uh, that really changed what happened to how we pictured nature. We started to leave the world of visual images 
thinking of constellations as animals and, and mythical uh, creatures and, and move towards abstraction in our way of mapping how the universe works until the picture we made of nature was really distant from any kind of thing that was in our imagination. Um, it's, it's very descriptive, but it's not always evocative. So I'm always working on how we can make ecology more visible and give everyone a path for understanding nature, not just people who go to college and read charts, learn to read charts and graphs, but everyone who's walking through the world. Um, so I feel strongly that you should be able to get just rock ecology just by walking down the street. And um, it's one of art's powers that it can give people these kind of clues and handholds about how nature works and bring those patterns right into people's everyday experiences, particularly when you're doing boring things like waiting for the bus or, you know, bike riding through a park. Um, that's not boring to bike ride through a park, but it's every day. And so how can these places inform us? We have a pretty limited and rather human centered sense of what nature is. We think of ourselves as central in the world and we tend to like to forget about the smaller things because sometimes we find them a little bit gross. But most of life on earth is invisible. And um, because we don't get to know it well, we don't really understand how the natural world functions. We have and this wonderful quote from Bonnie Bassler. We have the idea that we're the most central feature of the earth, but it's humans who are the bystander, the microorganism, microorganisms are doing most of the work. There's a spelling check. So it's really our job as artists working with scientists to increase people's knowledge about nature. And we can start by making these ecosystems more visible, more comprehensible, so we don't have our head in the sand or up a pipe. And I'm seeing how communicating science is becoming as important as the science itself. Because if you're sitting in your labs, creating basically stories of things, understandings of things, but no one is hearing those or understanding it themselves, it's getting lost in this world, hence our problem with people accepting climate crisis. So how do we get um, ecology out to people? And I do know, because I'm always exploring this, that nature can be hard to get because sometimes it's simply too small, like microorganisms, which you all know, um, like diatoms are uh, essential, but so hard to see. And I'm sure most of you who are working with diatoms came to them rather late in life. It wasn't something you could see in a puddle when you were a kid. The other problem is some things are just too vast, like the understanding, it's very hard to understand watersheds spreading throughout our neighborhoods and beyond. Um, sometimes things are way too fast. The patterns of water's movement, hydrological flow patterns are so quick. I always remember canoeing and wondering what that wonderful pattern that my paddle made. I could never understand what it was or, and it was so ephemeral, I couldn't hold on to it. Some things are also too slow. Very, it's very hard to see, say, a tide coming in and going out, particularly in the city. Um, or too obscure to trace like are the watersheds that are running under cities that are covered and culverted by streets. So we're gonna look at a few projects um, where I'm making natural processes more legible. And then I'm gonna take a look at the diatom work that I do in particular um, study of diatom. But what we'll start with is this pattern that I simply adore the pattern of vortices and it's how liquids and gases move and it exists on every level. Here we are with a map of hurricanes. The winds on planet Jupiter's eye are moving in vortices. And that's what happens with the milk in our cup of tea too. Um, it still has that same pattern. It's a real, it's the fractal that we live with, that this, this pattern happens everywhere at all liquids and gases. And I'm interested in why we don't know this pattern more, why we don't live around it. So I'm trying to make it happen in people's daily lives so that we really, it gets into our bones because we run through it and bike through it. Um, the carbon vortex street is one of these just extraordinary and beautiful patterns that I, I didn't find out about until um, college. Um, so this idea that you can see it and, and feel it and get to know it in this everyday basis, that's how we really get patterns into our system. And creating spaces, I'm very into creating architectural spaces that embody these patterns and introduce them to people. 
And so this art that I create can make places where people see and experience hydrology as one of the patterns, just right as they walk out of their, their uh, doors into their backyards. Because you can't see this pattern in the actual river water that it's representing, but the art freezes it for you to start to understand it. And it becomes like a mnemonic. So when you are watching water, you might be able to see that pattern from having gotten it through a stiller form. Um, I'm very inspired by Leonardo da Vinci and this idea of looking closely at natural patterns and describing them very carefully as he did in his notebooks. Um, and uh, the Japanese artist Hokusai um, has sort of was wonderful about this tradition of freezing the moment to make it visible. You can see how wave action is working here. So um, I'm interested in making the, the Carmen Vortex Street, this flow pattern, more visible in our lives and finding out that it has had an appearance in art before with Art Nouveau patterns. They're quite, um, quite similar to hyd hydrological patterns and we're probably based in them too. They're very accurate hydrological patterns. Um, and I am a great fan of scientific diagrams and I think they're wonderful ways of expressing how nature works, these illustrations. But how do you get those out of books and into the spaces we live? So um, this is a project in um, Ontario, the Ontario Science Center. So I'm creating a, a sort of stone stream so you can get to understand the hydrology of streams, um, showing how point bars are formed and the deepest path of water flow and how that hydrology is affecting the shape. And a place that you can sort of run through the meanders, feeling the meanders with your body so that you start to understand that that's the shape that rivers and streams take. I'm interested too in microorganisms and how uh, you should get to know them in your neighborhood. Um, so uh, pedaling past your neighbors seems like a nice idea. Um, a way to understand that shape of aquatic life forms, which are just extraordinary architecture that we don't know until we um, are really introduced to them. Um, and I think it's important to know the other neighbors the smaller neighbors in your neighborhood. And this is how you can meet them at your feet. I worked with the um, UW Department of Zoology on this project to make sure that I had the correct um, microorganisms for the water side and the land side of the street. But it's sort of like making a page from your biology textbook and sticking it into the city streets, say taking the form of some water life this stentor here and then making it into the street so we can read its patterns and get to know it by sandblasting it in stone so it sticks around a little bit and isn't quite as invisible. Um, Ernst Haeckel brought science and art together in his age in a similar way to Leonardo da Vinci, though more controversial. Um, and he viewed nature through the eyes of his age and adapted his objective illustrations to the perceptual paradigms of his day. Uh, uh, there's a very um, art, art nouveau quality to his work. He was um, very informed by the Jugendstil that was the Art Deco uh, movement that was going on in Germany uh, during concurrent with him. And maybe was also influencing art deco too because people were looking artists were looking at his the patterns of the microorganisms that he was bringing forth and illustrating and then they were starting to put them in furnishings bringing bringing science into the drawing room and even at the paris world's fair an extraordinary radiolar radiolarian um, inspired architecture which is quite wonderful the idea that the microscope spawned this view of microorganisms that then got translated to giant architecture. Um, so this idea that the framework of natural sciences became available to all classes of society, not the people, just the people who could afford the incredibly expensive scientific apparatus like a microscope, but to everyone through these illustrations is akin to what I'm trying to do where I'm trying to bring these patterns into people's lives. And I think we need to increase that kind of availability of living with the science of what surrounds us. 
and um, also celebrating these amazing forms. Uh, sometimes you play around with the color and scale. These are rather larger and more colorful than most diatoms, but the forms are true to their natural forms. This is a project I did um, in a big collaboration with scientists and uh, exhibit designers to show um, the, the patterns of nature with around uh, freshwater mussels. And actually, this is a lab for um, hatching freshwater mussels. I just realized my clock has stopped here, so let's get it going again. Um, and so this is my diatoms are on the other side of the actual um, of the actual lab where the fish are um, being inoculated with the glycidia of, that are, are making the young mussels. And so people are learning about um, the ecological processes in this space while it's happening. And I'm trying to pick up on many of the patterns like what the, what the uh, mussels are eating for lunch and which are diatoms and getting people close to these forms and letting them really see the invisible in a whole new way. And there's another section where we're showing the mussels food web and trying to make sense of this interconnectedness of nature, which people lose sight of fairly quickly. Um, so I created a food web that's carved in glass, which is um, both aesthetic, but also uh, functions as a um, rubbing uh, area you, that you can create rubbings of these critters um, and have an interactive time with these glass panels. Um, so I'm interested in ways of making the food web more intriguing and more approachable. I think that's where I started because I started looking at hugely um, increased, uh, hugely magnified uh, images of things that were a little bit gross like ticks and finding the architecture beautiful and evocative and getting very interested in the structure of the living world, seeing this amazing architecture and throwing in the critters that we already know who are eating them. Learning what, what is the lunch of the world is very in, important, I think. So I do think that getting up close and personal with the tiny parts, the gross parts, things that are mushy or scary or sort of turn you off, it's very important for kids to have this experience to see these um, these creatures up close so they appreciate them. And I think it's important to get to know the gross parts of life and see something we didn't appreciate before, like the microflorals of mold, the beautiful pattern of penicillium and aspergillus is gorgeous too. And learning about that, I remember, um, you know, I used to hate when my bread got moldy, but now when my kids were young, they would run up with fruit or bread that was moldy saying, look, look at the beautiful mold. So I felt like I had changed their perception of mold because they knew it as microflorals. Living with our natural patterns isn't new. The Egyptians were doing it in full swing, um, creating capitals of papyrus and lotus, celebrating their local essential ecology of the, the Nile Delta. And um, I've been looking into Icanthus, a very widespread plant in the Mediterranean, which was also extremely medicinal, celebrated in so many architectural forms. And um, been reading about the importance of Icanthus as a medicine might have made it feature prominently in art and design forms because it was important and they wanted to put it out there. It also happens to be very beautiful. But this, we have a tradition of botanical illustration. So why can't diatoms be the new floral pattern? Um, I've been uh, loving working with diatoms for many, many years. I carved them in glass and stone and the shape of diatoms and other microorganisms, this is fungi, um, really continues to compel me. Um, I like to show diatoms with their natural habitat. Here is a huge uh, tube of pond water. It's about three feet tall. And then uh, diatoms, you'll see them at the bottom are, are carved in, sandblasted into the glass. Um, I spent a fair bit of time in Barcelona walking on the Paseo de Gracia. If anyone's been to Barcelona, this is a very iconic streetscape of these beautiful tiles um, where Gaudi um, made uh, these kind of sea creature tiles that have then been taken, enlarged and taken outside and put in the walkway. And so I thought, hmm, what if I could make that with local diatoms? That would be kind of cool. Could I take the diatoms that were floating along the east, floating in the East River and make them be part of the pattern that's underfoot? 
Um, so I started with making several different sketches of some diatoms that I knew, knew might be in the river and some of these are, are um, marine. So that's a brackish situation. Um, but the idea was that I would create a gouty like depiction of diatoms underfoot, a carpet of microalgae that would be winding through this new park that's being built in New York City, right over the East River, cantilevered over the East River. So um, I spent a lot of time with my diatom library, um, which is not uh, that extensive, but pretty good for an artist. And I'm truly wishing that I could go on a collecting trip with that. There's the Rachel Carson out there and collect the diatoms in person. Um, I've, I've never had a chance to do that. But my first step was to get in touch with Judy Yakin Lee, who's the diatome expert for NOAA. Um, uh, she's the Long Island Sound uh, diatome expert um, and resides or does her work in Milford, Connecticut. So I went up there to work with her and bring her my sketches and models. And we talked about what was in the, the East River and the Long Island Sound and how I could depict them. And then I started to make more models after uh, we had met and um, having ongoing meetings with the New York City Parks and commissioning um, landscape architects or architects who are Stantec, um, there's a lot of meetings that go on, much less field work, many more meetings in my life, unfortunately. So here I'm trying to get this, this is a beautiful bracelet-like diatom. Could it be cast in concrete? So I'm drawing it up, trying to figure out how to make these, these casts. And I've made very detailed drawings of diatoms that are sandblasted into stone, but concrete has turned out to be a very different beast. These are, um, I'm creating cast concrete and the paver company had very strong rules for pressing concrete. Every, certain things had to be the same height, but things couldn't be any higher than a quarter of an inch for ADA uh, standards for access in the park. But they had to have um, that holes couldn't be any deeper than three eighths of an inch. So I was constantly trying to hold on to the details while the concrete pressing company was saying, I don't think you can do that. That's not going to press well. So I kept going back to my drawings and to creating with plasticine and paper and clay sometimes. Um, and also creating 3D models, which would be read by their machine that would create a mold. And um, then I, I was having trouble with a couple of diatoms. So I, I thought, oh, this will be a, a lovely one to try, the Bacturistrum, I'm not saying that right. And um, there it is in the 3D model. And finally, we got a pressing that was working with, with the, um, the concrete people, level of detail was okay. The edges were smooth enough. And I laid it out and I thought, uh-oh, we got a problem here. It looked way too much like a coronavirus. And so I just thought in this era, I didn't really want to put a diatome out there that looked like the coronavirus and have people be very confused. So I went back to the draw drawing board and uh, looked at the cyclotella as a possibility, created a plasticine model, um, how to make this in the simplified concrete way. And I'm constantly sending my pressing, my concrete company, models and they're saying no you got to take this off you got to flatten this you got to take this edge off this is too close to this so i was constantly having to simplify things but finally it took about a year of editing we have a tile that the concrete folk can um they think they can press them and in fact have pressed them and i could approve that the details were legible and beautiful enough um, so here we are, They're, the tiles are being pressed in a 15 ton concrete press. And now packs packed for shipping. They're um, gonna be on the truck very shortly and, and heading to New York City. Um, I think there are about uh, 3,000, 4,000 tiles that, that they're shipping in that will be making this kind of carpet throughout the, um, the Greenway, the East Midtown Greenway Park along the East River. So you can see as you're walking down the paving, you can see what's um, floating right next to you. There are only three diatoms that you're gonna see, but you get a sense that there's something going on in the water that's otherwise invisible. So it's a good way to get to know your, your neighbors um, that you wouldn't have any sense of otherwise. 
Um, so I'm still thrilled with diatoms that the concrete pressing didn't put me off, but I did get to do a project that was with a more detailable material with glass. I'm back at the studio creating a food web for the Independence uh, Seaport Museum, a, rivers, uh, a river food web. And here we are arranging the diatom stencils that are cut out of a special material that will then be sandblasted. Uh, this green stencil here, and we're sort of placing them on all the different panels. And here they are in this, um, in the museum that separate, this wall separates a classroom, blasted and installed. And um, inside this uh, what's in the river classroom uh, that separates the museum. And it was interesting that I, I have found that the I saw a shadow on my ceiling while I was doing this project that came out and looked just like a diatom. I think I'm not even sure what it was, but it's uh, they follow me around. So um, I do feel so strongly that as scientists and artists um, who work with ecology, we have to remember how important it is for people to understand what's around them and to hear the stories of nature and learn the stories of nature because our understanding of nature does not come naturally anymore. It's just, we have very little exposure to it. So um, if we have any hope of people learning to protect their environments, we have to teach them about their environments. And I do feel that artists and scientists are an absolutely natural fit to tell this story of ecology in a collaborative way. Um, and it's important to remember that the kind of work I do, the, the no eco art is made alone. Um, every project that I do, the, the best ones are collaborations across many disciplines from zoologists to ecologists, uh, botanists, and often education specialists too, as well as landscape architects and engineers. So I'm hoping that, that artists and scientists can tell the story of ecology together and make the natural world more visible to everyone in a very everyday way. And thanks very much for Zooming with me. Thanks, Stacy. That, that, was, that was wonderful, wonderful to hear. I, I'm just amazed at the, the number of uh, projects you've been able to work on where you've really gone to Gone, gone. You know, tried to tried to find that link between natural processes and your art. Um, if, if folks want to ask questions, feel free. You can type them in the chat. How many have we got? We got thirty eight people. We can. Why don't you type them in the chat? <clears throat> and if it uh, if it it seems like we can we can have people call on. Uh, I can call on you and have you on mute if you'd like to ask that question. But why don't you go ahead and type them in the chat if you want? Let me just ask a, a, a quick question. Um, you know, I come from the scientist, the scientist side of this thing, and I look at the types of art that you displayed or installations you displayed, and they seem to have all different types of media. Um, how do you, do people approach you with a specific idea in mind of what they want, or do you, do you end up having to find a, a media a medium that is going to be suitable for their projects. How, how do you how do you do that? You seem yeah, I mean, it seems like a, a visual question. artist describes you, but how do you uh, how do you go about trying to pick how you're going to approach each project? Well, the the joy of being an artist is that your projects are very open ended. You're often given a zone, a space, somewhere or a time. They can say, "Come to this gallery," and the, this you have September and do something in here. I'm often um, shown a kind of plan with a red X marks the spot where it's like, this would be a good place for art. And of course, I'm always dragged away to some other aspect of the landscape where something is occurring, some natural process is happening that um, I, I notice maybe it's extra soggy there or the wind is blowing or there's uh, invasive plant growth or something that um, that alerts me that there's something going on here that needs to be described. And so I will often glom onto that and then create ideas about how I'm going to tell that story and what material I'm going to use. And my materials are very much based in um, the temporality. It does this, does this piece need to last for 50 years or is it going to last for six months? 
and if it has different amounts of mm. lastability, I, I use very different materials for it. Um, how much budget do I have? Can it can can I afford stone and glass, um, or do I need to do this in a very different way with something like line striping paint, or um, uh, uh, plastic surveyor's flags? Um, so things are uh, different according to um, longevity and budget, and then. Sure putting those things together with the particular process that I want to show is how I figure out what the piece is going to be. But yeah. joyfully, it does get to be mostly up to the artist. And that's, I think yeah. we we pay for freedom with our low budgets for ourselves, but um, <laughs> it's very worthwhile to be able to choose what you want to do every day. Yeah, well, I love I loved seeing your 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 stuff. We, we are having some questions coming into the, the chat. Um, uh, Becky, why don't you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hi, Stacy. That was super fun. Um, I was wondering from a practical standpoint, um, in part because I've done some of this work as the scientist in the scientist and artist uh, conversation with putting exhibits together, how are you dealing with funding? It's not um, the most fun question, but just curious That's an interesting um am i dealing with it i'm managing but it's it's i'd always like more there's never enough you're always you're always um value engineering yourself which we all know is has neither anything to do with value nor engineering it's just making it damn cheaper um so i'm always coming up against financial issues and um my funding tends to come from uh sometimes individual institutions that have a a a building budget, they're putting in a new building and they want a terrace that has a watershed map on it. Or sometimes I work with 1%, the Seattle project was a sewage construction project and 1% of the budget goes towards art and art administration. The art actually sees about a half percent, but that's sometimes plenty. Um, and so they'll set up a project with a budget and say, go to, and then you get to decide where you want to do that project. And if you even want to have anything to do with um, what the work is that they're doing that's supporting it. I happen to be very interested in what was in the ground and that's where the sewage digging was taking place. So it had a nice resonance with that. Um, so the 1% commissions work. Um, the I just did a project, a parking lot intervention, which was through the NEA, and it was part of an Art Town grant that a city got, and then looked for artists who could um, connect the river to the city. And so it comes from various places, but there's never enough of it. And that's part, kind of part of the problem with long-term collaborations is I, I have trouble paying a scientist to um, collaborate with. So they sort of have to do it out of the kindness of their heart or because they're doing research that's similar, or they can write a paper about it. I try and make it as, you know, it, if though I can't make it lucrative, I can make it evocative. And um, so the budgets are often wouldn't be able to pay for a scientist to be on board full time. Um, so a lot of it is volunteer science. Um, and and that works, but it would work better if, if there were bigger budgets. I haven't tried for National Science Foundation money, though I do know other artists who have and have been rather successful at that, particularly artworks that have a restoration component to it. Um, so that sometimes works, but money seems to be short everywhere, but it's super short in the art world. So we're used to dealing with, you know, a pittance um, that that's quite typical. Well, thank, thanks for that yeah, question. Thank you. And thanks for giving us some uh, insight into what the funding, the funding world in art is like. Um, Christy, you've got a question, a little more practical question. Uh, could you go ahead and unmute yourself and feel free to ask it? Or if you don't, I will ask it. <laughs> Christy hasn't unmuted herself. Let me just ask the question to you, Stacy. Um, wanted to know when you install these etched pavers, um, is there a problem over time with getting them clogged with dirt and becoming less legible? Do they need a maintenance schedule as, as after installation where they need to be power washed or cleaned or? Um... All, all things need a maintenance schedule. I mean, sure. that's we cut our hair, we brush our teeth um, and stone is the same way. 
Uh, it does sometimes get clogged, particularly the smaller, more detailed holes, but it also sometimes washes away. So it can have clogged periods and then a torrential rain comes and washes that, that silt to another, somebody else's project or to somewhere else. Um, so it, it moves around, it's a little like beach erosion. But yes, I do plan, I do always create maintenance plans for these, whether they're followed or not when I'm not there who knows, but um, I create maintenance plans. And actually my biggest enemy is uh, street salt, salt for road salt for um, oh, yeah. uh, de-icing roads because that's very hard on the stone over time. Uh, so building in freeze thaw areas is a little tricky. Um, yes, things, um, they do, they do, they do a little bit of erosion too. I, in the Seattle pieces, that stone's a little bit softer because I want to use a native uh, sandstone. Um, so there've been some parts that erode, but I put in so much detail that I feel like if it, a little bit of the detail goes out of it, it's like, I look at, you know, I look at my wedding ring and how the, the, the detail on the leaves that were once wrapping the gold band are now sort of quite obscure but you can sort of sense it but they were very detailed in the beginning so i think about that kind of patina of time and what will happen because i often build in floodplains i do get a lot of um, flooding over my projects and that does have to be cleaned out sometimes it can be done dry with just brooms and um, sometimes I do have to pressure wash them, but you have to be very careful with the, the tinier margins of stone because you can, you can knock those out. Um, I have a project that is a, actually it's a memorial um, for the Congressional Medal of Honor recipients in Pennsylvania. And my biggest issue there is candle wax. Um, people leave candles and it, the, the oil melts into the stone and, and leaves a waxy stain. I also have issues with mayonnaise and people eating lunch <laughs> on my projects, um, which you can poultice stones that, um, that get greasy, though it's a long process and doesn't work perfectly. So um, you have to think that these things are all going to have a lot of wear and tear and sort of design knowing that that's going to happen. But yes, everything needs a certain amount of maintenance. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Elena, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, uh, your question about, uh, again, more of the details on the actual process of creating the art. Hi. Um, my question is uh, more on the glass etching side. Um, what kind of masking vinyl do you use for your glass etchings? And also, are you do you have access to an industrial size glass blower or glass blaster, um, or is it something that you have in your studio as well? That it's a very interesting question because I've had one crazy year trying to get hold of the very material that I've always used to sandblast, which is referred to as stencil um, and the couple of companies, 3M used to make it and Anchor Continental used to make it. And everyone seems to be either closing down or their factory got flooded, another got burnt down. And in the last couple of years, getting hold of stencil, it's like hen's teeth. It's so difficult. Um, and it's held up a project that I'm in the midst of because we could not get hold of the amount of stencil we needed. I, I wonder if it's going the way of, of haberdashery and glove making. I'm not sure that it will be available um, for that much longer. And a very strange and eerie part of the shortage of stencil is because so many people in America and the world need headstones because of the death from COVID. Um, that there's been a run on this material, which is already limited, and it's it's very, very hard to get to. So in some ways, the stencil is part of the last responders materials. The last responders are the headstone makers who were, you know, people are being laid into the ground and their headstones are being put in graveyards um, at a rate that is um, unsurpassed at any other time in America, maybe not I mean, the Civil War, but um, they, they're making a lot of headstones these days. So it is, this, it is this product that's getting harder and harder to get, but it's kind of like a bouncy contact paper that you lay on the stone and then cut directly into. Some people can cut with um, computers. I prefer a hand cutting because I just think it looks better and um, it has 
it has the soul of me in it, which changes how things look. And I just cut it with an X-Acto blade. And I do have my own sand blaster, which I can blast sand with, I mean, blast glass with, um, but I can't blast stone with it. I, it's, it's just not powerful enough, though I have a massive compressor and I do have a pretty big blaster that I've had for years. And it's very gritty, filthy work to sandblast. You are um, probably not good for your lungs either because it's aluminum silicate. I've done my fair share of sandblasting in, in college myself. So I was really curious as to the setup that you have. It's interesting how I, st I started sandblasting simply because the glass department where I had my MFA was very, very small. It literally didn't have very much floor space. So they put the sandblaster in the sculpture department and I was very curious. And I started, the first thing I ever sandblasted wasn't glass, but it was the enamel off of old sinks so that I could write the name of cities on the sinks on a project all about drinking water, which is in Philadelphia. Hmm. Neat. Thank, thanks, thanks, Elena, for that question. Thanks, Stacy. Um, oh, David is is already ready to buy your tiles, so he wants to know. He not wants to know if they're up on up on uh, Etsy yet, so he, he can. Well, uh, not yet. It, I have I, I haven't seen a printed one, but I did. We did print a print. We we pressed a few extras, so I'm hoping that um, that will happen. I'm also really wanting to make some <laughs> swag, some diatom swag of uh, socks and maybe neckties um, with that pattern in it because I always think about how like old fashioned tie patterns look rather like diatoms if you didn't know any better. Um, and so why can't they be something real? I think that whole idea of bringing this pattern into your everyday would be perfect on your socks. Well, um, our next question came from Emma and I think it, it harkens back to your, um, I thought your, your opening, opening line today was really good where you said, Artists and scientists need to hold hands and go on several dates. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Emma's got a question about developing those collaborations. Emma, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, please ask ask your question. Hi, Stacey. Um, hey. So I come from a background of education and art. And I work right now at a uh, STEM-focused university. And I am wondering when you are collaborating with folks in different disciplines, you know, whether it be science or physics or, you know, whatever you do, um, how do you go about having conversations with them when you're not very familiar with their discipline? Right. Well, it's, it's my job to get a little bit up to speed, you know, get a okay. kind of kindergarten level understanding and, um, how I, and I come in with a lot of questions about why things are as they are, but it is, it is my job to get a basic, a basic sense of what's going on um, through research. And I do that. I, I like books myself. So I tend to do that through the library and also um, digitally too. Um, and then I meet with this, uh, the scientists in their, usually in their spaces, in their labs. Um, but sometimes we have, we are meeting outside because everyone's outside. When I'm working with acid mine drainage, um, I have met with the scientists out on the site because we're all looking at the site together. Um, and we have a lot of lunches where we talk about the possibilities. And um, so it's a little it takes a little more time because we have to speak each other's languages. And certainly I've given out a great number of artistic licenses to people um, so that scientists can also go ahead and, and start to think in this way too. Um, I don't just have to think like a scientist, the, the scientists also benefit from thinking like artists. And strangely enough, it's a very similar way of thinking. It's just that artists, don't have to come out with an answer at the end. I think that's where we diverge. But otherwise, it's all based in curiosity and wanting to know how things work and a love of the world and wanting to share that. I'm always amazed how scientists have a very strong desire to share their knowledge because they love what they're talking about and they want it to pour out into the world too. They know how important what they're doing is and they need others to share it so that um, people don't walk around having you know, their eyes closed and their ears plugged. So um, that desire to know and to share is very kindred with artists and scientists. Thank you.
Any more questions? I actually, I, I, I spoke much more like an auctioneer during my talk and cleared an extra 10 minutes off of it. So there's lots of time for questions. I actually, I have a question for the um, scientists who are on board. Have any of you had experiences working with artists and um, on particular projects and what was that like and what were the best parts and what didn't work? I, I apparently was unmuted there for, or I was muted there for a, a few seconds when I tried to talk. So I went, <laughs> thanks you, Josh, for pointing that out to me. Um, let me give let me give Hira a chance to ask her question if she could un unmute herself and, and go ahead and do that. I apologize for doing that. There was a little noise here in the shop and I thought I would better mute myself and forgot to unmute myself. Well, Hira is not unmuting, so let me just ask her question. Um, and it's a question that, that came to my mind as well. Is it, Do you provide any training or workshop for scientists or regular people who are who are not artists you know in, in no certain... great idea no never even yeah. thought to do that till now okay yeah yeah had... it's a great idea i should i mean it's it's something where you know i talk about artists and scientists holding hands and dating but i think maybe we need a matchmaker to a, a kind of clearing house where if you say boy i've always wanted to work with an artist or you know, someone I could really, I could really use a new way of visualizing this project that I just got funding for. How could I find an artist? Maybe there needs to be some kind of clearinghouse where we could find each other through projects, or I could post, I'm working on diatoms on the East River. I mean, normally I, I go and find scientists, but it might be nice if there was a, a, a dating site for us to get together. Yeah, it's sort of, sort of like the the wine and painting things where you get together and um, yeah yeah or the, it'd be nice if there were like um maybe it's not a particular project but you get together for a week and in a place where you say okay here's some issues with the site how could we make them visible while we're solving the site issue and that's what i try and do as an artist and it's actually what engineers do all the time except they forget the make it visual part one of the things at the, the research station where I'm housed, we have a um, artist in residence program that's called the Pine Needles Artist in Residence Program. And one of the things that we encourage the artists who come to do is to engage in it, both with uh, undertake some community engagement. So either mm -hmm. interacting with the, the local community here, or we've also had them um, um, inter interact with the scientists mm -hmm. where we've had them you know, come up with a an art project where we're, we're asked to, you know, essentially provided the medium and we need to provide the, the art that goes into our, our, our product. So we've had, we've done uh, block, cut, block cutting and printmaking as, mm, as examples of yeah. that, um, where we've been able to use our, you know, take, take our, our scientific knowledge to a uh, again for us a very different venue but it's, it's right a neat, that's that's it's a really neat, cool. it's a neat uh, a neat connection for us to make and i wonder if it's also a way to try to develop those types of collaborations and interactions where you can you know at least pique people's interest and and you know find the find those contacts like that yeah i mean residencies have been a great thing and i think that every lab should sort of have an occasional resident artist come through i think it I think it stirs up the kind of thinking that scientists do. So it can be very refreshing to um, be asked questions about your research that you didn't even think mattered, that didn't, they didn't catch your eye, but they're catching someone else's eye, a, 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 an artist's eye perhaps. And it could be something you've just never considered making um, more apparent or looking into or making a connection with. So I think it can be a very fertile connection too and, and really help people broaden how they, they see um, what they're doing scientifically. I mean, I'm doing that with, when I'm working with scientists, I'm trying to broaden my very narrow artistic view and the idea that 
most artists sort of work on their own in um, their studios, which I find a little bit dull and lonesome. And having this um, interaction um, enriches your work and gives you new things to think about that are sitting within your work, but you didn't recognize them because you've, you've just gotten used to it. So bringing in the new, the new view, I think is a really important part of this kind of collaborative effort. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, Margarita has, has, uh, has indicated that she's got a connection <laughs> for you in Seattle okay. for that, for that okay. sand blasting vinyl. Uh, Ace these emails up on the stage, go ahead and, and contact her with those kind of gems. We've also uh, on, on the thing is, is uh, Stacy's um, website for her, her, uh, her company as well. Um, uh, Eco Art Space ooh, uh, has, has, has asked a question. If, you, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it, please go ahead. Hello. Hello, hello. There, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Stacy. So, hey there, how yeah, are you? Thanks for coming. I'm doing good. Um, so I heard you say that uh, something about scientists not having enough time maybe in the collaborations you've done, but I'm always curious about how open they've been to, um, you know, the difference between, as I understand it, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary is that um, in a collaboration that if it's transdisciplinary, that you're both coming from your disciplines equally to create a project together. So you each have you know, no, one's not leading the other, you're, um, you're equal in what you're setting out to achieve. So have you, have you experienced that or are we not there yeah. yet? No, I think, I think it, it's very dependent on the project. Um, if the scientists are also discovering new things while you're um, trying to figure out what's going on in the project. It's not old hat kind of problem. Um, then the um, the collaboration between the artists and scientists is is more intense. I certainly had this with the acid mine drainage project that I did out in central South Central uh, Pennsylvania with um, coal mining um, pollution and solutions for this were being worked you know as we were working we were we were honing solutions at the same time so it was great to be in that kind of in the process where the artist i mean i was found myself like could we be doing this how about this now that I, once i had learned the system and um we were able to make changes to the system so that was a really great collaboration there are other times where it's not as deep, it's not as inter, um, because there's information, I, I may need a simpler amount of information. Um, for this, the diatom project on the uh, East Midtown Greenway, I needed to know what was floating in the river. And um, because it was more pictorial and less process, um, that was, I didn't need a deeper collaboration than that. But the nice thing that can happen sometimes is you sort of get your one job done and then it spins off into something else because at lunch you were talking about something with diatoms or the next thing you know, you're thinking about how you can show it over here or it relates to another project that the scientist is doing. And so it can spin out into yet another collaboration. And those are always great when that happens. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for that. that, 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 that <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Margarita, you, uh, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Margarita, you had, you had indicated you'd like to, you've, you've in, brought up some interesting ideas about um, connecting people. Uh, if you'd like to unmute, go ahead and, uh, and you can say something to Stacy for sure. Yeah, mostly, hello, incredible work, hey, Stacy. <laughs> hey, I, I just want to tell you that it's, um, it's, it's just fantastic. And um, you help to magnify the unseen world in the most practical way for everybody to understand it and put magic under our feet and above our heads and look in every direction and discover something new and uh 
just the ongoing learning and discovery that's the magic of life i just want to thank you so much it's been such a a, a great honor to get to exhibit with you too get thank to you know. that's 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 a i'm gonna i'm gonna walk around with that comment in my head for about a week mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you thank you all right well thank you so much stacy this has been a wonderful hour on on our diatom web academy to spend with you and see a you know a really a, a different connection we all need to make um in this world with um new audiences and ways to you know find a find our a way to you know, share what excites us with so many more people and i think that's that's been such a, a blessing to uh to hear hear your 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 outlook on this um, thank Great. you. For, thank Great. you for joining us all today. Right. Let's tell the story yeah. together. <laughs> yeah, it's as with um, all of our our uh, Diatom Web Academies, they're going to be available uh, in a, within the next week or so on on our YouTube channel. You can always find that <clears throat> at diatoms.org, as well as all the announcements for the next um, upcoming Diatom Web Academies in two weeks, Tuesday, November eighth. Ed Terrio is going to join us. Um, and he's going to be speaking about if you think there are cryptic species, you may need to, uh, you may not under fully understand uh, species concepts, a compelling title that hopefully will get us a, uh, an interesting uh, discussion going after, after his presentation. I want to thank you again, Stacy, and thank you everyone for joining us today from no matter where you tuned in. And again, uh, share the news about Diatom Web Academy and share the, uh, the, the, how, how, how important diatoms.org is to uh, bring our community together. That's Thank great. Thanks, Mark. And thanks everyone who came. And, and I really appreciate everyone spending their, their lunch time, if it is lunch, um, with me, since diatoms are often the lunch of the food chain. So <laughs> uh, thanks so much. Good messaging. Good messaging. <laughs>